Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Resource Gatherer podcast. I'm your host, Justin Hayward. As you can see, Shazan is not here today as he had some work-life stuff going on. As we talked about in the first episode, we're people with real jobs. And so as we continue to create this product, there might be weeks where we might not be able to make any content just because we're both busy, or it might just be just me because, well, we're both busy people and I'm the one with all the equipment. So for this week, I'm gonna keep it pretty short with the sort of strategy of what we're gonna be going into, and that's gonna be talking about something that I'm really passionate about in the D&D community, and that's going to be homebrewing. For those of you who don't know what homebrewing is, essentially homebrewing is creating something from scratch for D&D content. You might have noticed that, for example, in the Monster Manual campaign, while it was defined as a 5e-style campaign, everything was homebrewed. And the reason why this was created in that fashion was I wanted to take everything that I loved about D&D and everything I loved about one of my childhood favorite uh, products, Pokemon, combine those two things together in order to create an entirely new product to showcase to both my friends and you, the audience at home. How do you homebrew? That's the question I always asked myself whenever I initially started doing this type of content. And I realized that the best way to do it is to first look at the source material. Get yourself really, really, really coordinated with that style of play. D&D 5e, for example, is a very simplified version of the original Dungeons & Dragons game. It has allowed a lot of new players to join, but one of the biggest drawbacks that a lot of people who've played previous editions understand is that while 5e is great for focusing on story elements, one of the things that it doesn't allow you to have is the levels of customization that other games would have, including that of 3.5 and the offshoot that eventually became Pathfinder. And this is really where I tell people as a beginner to homebrew where to start. Oftentimes, anything you're looking to create has already been created before. The game's been around for decades now, and so it's really hard to determine what hasn't been made or unique. If you're looking for something to reference or how to create a new item, let's say, for example, you really want to create this mythical item for your rogue, and you want them to be able to do additional psychic damage when they stab something. If it's not in the D&D handbook or one of the additional resources and one of the earlier editions, Pathfinder most likely has an option that you can use as a reference point. And so I always strongly recommend that you start there. Looking at what has already been done and built upon the things that people have already done, especially in your home games where you're not looking to record or to take financial gain from these products that other people have already created. Now, in regards to creating your own products, that is really where I'm going to be diving into for the rest of this sort of session. For example, how did I create Monster Manual? I've had questions of how to create custom material before, and the best way I can describe it is you kind of just do it. For Monster Manual, the biggest thing, as you notice throughout the show, is we continue to progress the overall strategy of how to perform the product. And so what I did was, is I took the idea and concepts that I initially established whenever I wanted to think about what is Pokemon, and I thought about what is D&D, And how did I create a sort of layer where they both combined? And so one of the areas that I really thought was really cool was looking at the monsters inside of the monster manual. And that's why when you started the campaign, each of the players were given a familiar from the familiars list. This allowed me to A, have access to a very simple flight list, each of these monsters having their own unique types, uh, one of the eight types that I would then create. And then it was about balancing. So for each type in Pokemon, there is a type that you have advantage on, uh, super effective effects, and one that you have disadvantage on, a sort of super effective effect against you. And that's really where I focused the story points in regards to how I established what I wanted for my story. And this is why each of the eight types has a counterpoint where they are super effective against one thing and something is super effective against them. I really liked that element of Pokemon, and so I thought that that was really important to bring into the game. Another thing I really wanted to do is I wanted to create this style of monster manual to be very Dark Soulsy. I wanted it to be scary for these monsters in this world. So how I did that was through a process in which I focused on the element of advantage. So one of the biggest things that as a D&D player you'll know is that 
Advantage is huge when it comes to rolling dice. If you have the ability to roll two dice instead of one, your chances of getting a natural crit or a higher roll are always going to be in the player's favor. And that is why when it came to monsters against humanoids, I always gave the monsters an advantage. And that created this scary situation where any time a human got into combat with physical melee attacks against a monster, they were putting themselves at risk. While the monster, on the other hand, would only have to worry about regular rolls against humans, meaning that the monsters were always going to be scarier, and it created a very, very unique dynamic. The issue that I ran into in the early stages of building this was that AC mattered, and that was really where it became a thing where players were rolling a lot of dice, but players weren't getting a lot of hits. And so one of the ways that I tried to mitigate this was actually through one of the players, Josh, sort of talked to me about dropping the AC, but raising the hit points. And that's really where I think the game started becoming a lot more fun. Because everyone's rolling dice every turn and everyone's attacking and doing these massive amounts of damage. But these monsters are still, you know, surviving round after round. And so it made combat more interesting. Another element that was really popular within the Pokemon world was the exploration element. As anyone may have seen inside of the Dice Age experience, exploration seems to be something that I've noticed in earlier editions of Dungeons and Dragons. It's not something that's really as important in the later stages. Most people focus less on the dungeon crawling aspect and the exploration that was really great for early editions where rogues were really popular. And now it feels like in a lot of games, rogues don't hold that same level of value that they held in earlier editions. And that was what I wanted to focus on in the type of stories that I was telling through Monster Manual and through Dice Age. When it came to the game mechanics, I focused everything for Monster Manual being on the idea of what can stay from D&D and what do I need to create. And really the only elements that were created were essentially the elements that focused on the monsters. That being the advantage type, the monsters themselves were f directly from the book. But how I changed them was giving them each a type. And these types changed the appearance of them. But ultimately, even when you're homebrewing or creating something from new, you can use a reference point like I originally established in the beginning of the podcast when that comes to Pathfinder or from the D&D uh, guide itself, and you can change how it looks or how you want to present the information. For example, if we go into Dice Age, again, this is a spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen Dice Age, the homebrew monster that I created in the season one, episode three, I believe, where I created a zombie snowman. I didn't really do a lot with the snowman element itself in regards to creating a new creature. What I did was I took zombie stats, and then I added the flare, the visual flare of the snow to create this sort of new environment, this new monster that was sort of hybrid of my own. And that's really where I think, as a player and as a DM, you can start playing into those elements of essentially establishing what you want from D&D &D, and then talking to your DM or as the DM figuring out what you want from your players or to give your players to create those new elements that aren't really necessarily exactly homebrew, but are flared in a way that you feel like you're getting something out of it as a D&D &D player. And that's really where I think as a DM, I really wanted to focus in on was how do I take this game that I love and make it my own? Because ultimately, as a writer and as a storyteller, I think it's really important for you to take someone else's work, even if it is a module or something else, and define how you want to tell the story and what your voice brings to this game that someone else couldn't do doing the exact same experience. And that's what makes having different style DMs so important, is that it allows us to see, hey, I understand that as a DM, I have this very different style than say, for example, whenever Shazan DMs. And because of that, I could bring that uniqueness to the game every time that I DM. And that's really what I think is really mostly important whenever you're looking at how to DM, how to add unique features, and what you can do in order to create new content. As I said before, this is going to be a, a shorter episode because it's just me and I don't have the sway back and forth with Shazan's uh, witty humor. So I'm going to go ahead and cut the episode here. But thank you guys for listening, and as always, we'll continue to try to make content every week. There might be weeks where we take breaks. Again, we both work 40-hour week jobs. 
both normal people, but we'll continue to try to strive to give our audience and our listeners content for them to be able to consume. Thank you again.